Aspen may have been born on the luster of silver mining, but it is the visionary vein of its inhabitants that is Aspen's lifeblood. Whip Jones is keeper of that local attitude, the maverick mindset that draws scores of people to Aspen and keeps them here. I call it my, where temerity came from, a, a temeric behavior. It's kind of bold to, uh, to take on some of these things, and, uh, uh, but it worked out well for all of us. Whipple Van Ness Jones first skied as a boy, growing up in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. After graduating from Harvard, he joined an investment banking firm in St. Louis, where his success enabled him to retire to Aspen in 1950. Whip enjoyed the excellent skiing on Aspen Mountain, but he was too energetic to simply pleasure ski and wanted a project. So in 1955, he purchased the private base land and founded Aspen Highlands. The Highlands started uh, one day when Jenny Henry and Patrick Henry and Had Dean said that they were going to build a ski area at the P. Lazy 7 Ranch. And just about that time, the Forest Service came to me and said, Aspen Mountain is getting crowded, and we think the next ski area should be at Aspen Highlands, the land that I owned. And uh, I then hired Dick Durrance to do a feasibility report, and Dick did that, and thought that a ski area was feasible at Highlands. I think at Highlands, it would be a mistake not to develop it, and Whip deserves a lot of credit for seeing that when he did. So, with the feasibility report, I thought to myself, well, why don't I do it then, and, and uh, build a ski area there. And, uh, I had a little extra cash at that time, and so I started it. Aspen Highlands opened in November 1957 with its and WIPS defining characteristic firmly intact, uniqueness. I think the thing that set Aspen Highlands apart was the fact that the ski company always sort of looked down their nose at Aspen Highland. And, uh, didn't really consider us much of a competitor, but we thought that we were a great competitor. <laughs> we, what we had to do, I think, in order to compete with the other three mountains was he really had to entertain. And, uh, you know, we had the hot dog uh, contest on Fridays and we had the patrol jump every day that was sunny. We did quite a few things that were different. And Sunday afternoon, Stein Erickson used to do his somersault. And after I'd done that for a year or two, <coughs> I remember you came to me and you said, uh, Stein, what about uh, doing the flip on top of the mountain up by cloud nine? And I said, to me, it doesn't really make any difference, but uh, I'll be glad to do that. So we went up and looked at the location, and we had that beautiful pyramid peak in the background. And it was a cornice up there, I remember, natural for a flip, absolutely perfect. So I realized that, uh, it was a good idea, really, because for you, you could get more revenue out of the lifting. It's people wanted to see me at one o'clock, and uh, of course, being on top, people had to buy a lift ticket. So you taught me a little bit about the ski business whip. You were pretty, pretty smart. Stein Erickson was Highland's first director of skiing for six years, followed by Fred Islin for another six. Fred was a stylish, charming Swiss expert whose humor and joie de vivre gave the area panache. Fred would, was a very articulate and had fun with all kinds of different people, particularly the Hollywood crowd. By the time the first free bus arrives from nearby Aspen, the Highlands is ready. And so are Aspen Highlands 150 highly skilled ski instructors. They teach the graduated link method. And if you can't ski from the mid mound to the base lodge after your third day on skis, they'll give you your money back. That was not brought in 
until Fred Islin left and Lefty Brinkman came in. And Lefty Brinkman sponsored the graduated length of ski system. And uh, we were probably at one time the, the biggest school in the country using that method. From horse ranch to beginner slopes, to tennis ranch, to the Y zones. Highland's history, perhaps its very nature, is one of evolution and energy, like Whip Jones. And I look at all the people that I've worked with for a long time, kind of wonder what did, what was Whip all about, and I say, well, look around the mountain. You know, Don's energy and Whip's vision is what made this mountain, you know, what it is today. I'd just like to say that uh, I just think it's great, Whip, that you're being inducted into the Ski Hall of Fame and uh, uh, we're still very proud of you for uh, uh, what you did with this area and uh, you were a great employer for all those years and we just really appreciate you. I can't say much better than that. I mean, uh, uh, WIP was an inspiration to the people that worked here of having to, uh, um, looking at what he, his envision of this mountain was as being something for everybody, from the beginner to the intermediate to the expert, and he didn't ever let that die. He wanted to make it work, he wanted to make it pay, and he was uh, successful, and uh, he has a, a huge following of people, local people, who love to ski Highlands. It was his life work, and as he passed 80 in 1992, he donated it to his alma mater, Harvard. When uh, Harvard sold Aspen Highlands uh, to uh, Jerry Hines, that it was one of the most fortunate things that ever happened to Aspen. Gee, he sure didn't set the price that way. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it's, it's great to have talked to Whip about the visions that he had and what we finally integrated into the village and we think it'll be a, a tribute to his vision and his original efforts in Highlands. So Whip, we wish you the best and I want to be here to celebrate your hundredth. As you leave the concert tent in summer or drive into Aspen from the west in any season, I hope you will look at the trails of Highlands and remember our 1998 Hall of Famer, Whit Jones. All that I can say is I'm gratified and I'll try to behave myself so that I deserve the honor. <laughs>